Some people might believe that the truth is available to them. They might take a set of moral laws, scientific fact, or fundamental constituents of reality as true. They might rely, for instance, on the interpretations of a scripture by a religious community or on the latest statement of a scientific community. Other people might believe that there is no universal truth and that everyone has the right to take what appears to them as the truth. They might feel no need to research how things appear to others or what arguments they have for it. However, these two attitudes are not exhaustive. There is at least a third attitude available to people who neither want to ask science, religion, or any other institution or individual to deliver the truth to them, nor want they give up researching alternative takes on how things appear to them. Today, I will analyze a set of related concepts that yields this third attitude. Those of you who are familiar with the ancient Greek philosopher and physician Sextus Empiricus might have recognized the above as a rearrangement of the beginning of Sextus' outlines of Pyrrhonism. I quote, in the case of philosophical investigations, some have said that they have discovered the truth, some have asserted that they cannot be apprehended, that it cannot be apprehended, and others are still investigating. Sextus explains that both those who believe to have found the truth and those who are certain that it cannot be found have something in common. They both stop searching. On the contrary, the third group, the Pyrrhonia skeptics, to whom Sextus belongs, keep on searching, questioning, investigating. Setusi hoi skepticoi. Sextus explains that both, uh, sorry, um, skepsis means inquiry, investigation, research in ancient Greek. As we will see, what he enjoins his reader to investigate are assumptions and biases, underlying opposed or conflicting judgments about the nature of reality. When realizing that an opposed judgment can be found to any ontological statement, we are not tempted to take any of them as describing reality as it really is. A statement of ataraxia, tranquility or undisturbedness might well accompany the continuous search for what each view depends on. Such search will engender a dissentering. Neither our view nor any new view will be seen as central and absolutely true. This centering must be continuously performed. It is the remedy we have for our innate tendency to dogmatism, that is for putting ourselves in the center of the picture and for believing that, that how we see things grants us access to how things are for everyone. In medieval Japan, the Zen Buddhist Dogen was also convinced that one should make continuous effort at becoming aware of and shedding the fundamental hidden assumptions that color the way we look at reality. This can be done by continuously contrasting our assumption with those of human and non-human others who are different from us. The enlightenment or awakening that might accompany this continuous practice can be described as a temporary success in shedding one prejudices. However, enlightenment is not the promise of a view from nowhere or a complete access to the nature of reality. In fact, when one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. When we shed light on something, we inevitably leave something else in the dark. Nobody can occupy the center of the picture, the place from where everything is clear. Dogen adds a layer to the practice of continuous decentering that is not present in Sextus. Not only should we aim at refraining from dogmatism and being undisturbed by polarized disputes, we should also try to act responsibly while living our positioned existence among many other positioned others. By continuously decentering, we try to respond in an attuned way to the human and non-human others with whom we are 
intertwined. So what is my method today? I will conduct an intercultural dialogue with different texts and engage in the constructive dimension of comparative philosophy. More specifically, my method consists in appropriating conceptual tools offered by philosophers of different times and places and using them to formulate a concept, continuous decentering, which I recommend as a practice to my contemporaries in the 21st century. My tools come mainly from the Greek skeptic Sexus and Japanese Buddhist Dogen. I will also refer to a few contemporary thinkers, such as the contemporary historian of science and philosopher Donna Haraway. Continuous decentering. This is the foundation of the third attitude, which does not accept any truth as absolute and does not give up on finding truth either. Continuous decentering involves the following aspects, situatedness, decentering, and continuous practice. I will concentrate on these three aspects and I will only signal that continuous decentering provides the basis, not only for a responsible uh, search for shared truth and a greater understanding for complex topics, but also for any interaction across differences, such as dialogues and other way of relating to other beings with whom we share our world. One, the first of the three aspects that we will deal with in this today uh, is situatedness. The practice of continuous decentering starts in fact with developing an awareness of one's own situatedness, which entails that everybody looks at and experiences things from a certain position. This position depends on many factors, among which perceptual apparatus, ways of life, values, social class, embodiment, place, the aim of one's research, the methodology of a certain discipline, including its assumptions and the arguments that are regarded as valid and other factors. Two, next to our own situatedness, there is the situatedness of the object of our inquiry or of another inquirer who studies our object or studies us from a different position. The recognition of everybody's situatedness and of the existence of different points of view leads to the second aspect, decentering. It is the realization that we are not at the center of the universe. We do not occupy a neutral position. We do not possess a view from nowhere or God's eye view. Once the other, be it a person, a text, or a non-human being, is seen as a holder of a distinct situatedness with the possibility of a different point of view, we might open ourselves to them and we might value the diversity of the other that can help us shed lights on spots that were in the dark for us. Three, the recognition of situatedness and the centering are steps that need to be continuously practiced. Continuous decentering consists in realizing both our situatedness and that, and that of the other time and again. In each situation we find ourselves, be it a scientific research, a political decision, or a dialogue across differences. Practicing this type of dynamic decentering might be the only way to open a shared space in which we can responsibly collaborate, research, co-create a shared truth for the time being and live together. As anticipated above, Sextus introduces himself as part of the tradition, the Pyrrhonian skeptics that keep investigating rather than accepting some truth or rejecting them all. What do they keep investigating? Their objects are those truths that some people take as absolute and what those truths depend on. So concepts such as God, change, cause. So Sextus inquiry has been called a second order inquiry on different views on reality, on what situatedness, what perceptual apparatus, way of life, circumstances, assumption, such views depend. So, and how are the skeptics investigating appearances? That is, 
what appears to different people. Theories and judgment are not studied on their own, but always contrasted with opposed or conflicting judgments. By setting things in opposition, the situatedness of various contenders to the truth is revealed, which prevents the researchers from becoming dogmatic. The will uh, not risk taking any view as the objective, absolute, or neutral view. In the course of the 20th century and the 21st century, the realization of our situatedness has received more and more attention. Not only our embodied interaction with our environment influences our concepts and our language, think of Varela, Thompson and Roche, Lake of and Johnson, Gallagher and Bauer, but also our history, our gender, class, discipline, way of life have been shown to involve assumptions, selections and reductions that inform what we see and what we regard as true. In the second or third century of the common era, Sexus discusses among the various tools or arguments that can help us refute dogmatism, the 10 modes, 10 tropoi at length. Each mode makes us aware of one of the 10 factors on which what appears to us is dependent. Today, I will mention only two of them. Mode one, the dependence on what appears to one, on what kind of animal one is. And mode four, in what kind of circumstances one is. Mode one shows that the sense impression one has depends on uh, what kind of animal one is. Some of the arguments given focus on the differences um, ac across the perceptual apparatuses. For instance, if, convex, uh, sorry, if concave and convex mirrors reflect the image they form, animals with different shape of eyes will see different things. Similar arguments are given for other senses. And thus, I quote, it is probable, probable that the external objects appear different owing to differences in the structure of the animals which experience the sense impression. After this, Sexus illustrates different preferences and aversions of different animals. Then he zooms on, on the dog, who seems to have sharper perceptions than ours, and displays virtues such as justice and intelligence, which he analyzes as internal or private reason and external reason or speech. Sexus tells us, if people think that animals lack speech, it is because they do not understand what animals say. So uh, we have no reason to regard how things appear to us as closer to the truth than how things appear to other animals. Mode four focuses on the circumstantial conditions. Our mental states, our waking or sleeping, age, motion or rest, but also, I quote, hatred or love, confidence or fear, grief or joy, unquote. Sexus argues that only if a judge would be in no condition whatsoever, they could decide who between two contestants perceives the things as they are. Quote, but to say that he is in no condition whatsoever, that he is neither healthy nor sick, neither moving nor at rest, of no particular age and free from the other conditions is perfectly incongruous, unquote. So that there is no person there is no person who is not in any condition whatsoever. And situatedness is not a flaw that can be overcome. It is the inevitable starting point of any human or non-human attempt to know one's world. Dogen agrees with Sextus. Different beings perceive differently. And so do humans in different kinds of situation. I quote, when you sail out in a boat to the middle of the ocean, where no land is in sight, and view the four directions, the ocean looks circular and does not look any other way. But the ocean is neither round nor square. Its features an, are an infinite variety. It is like a palace. It is like a jewel, unquote. Dogen enjoins his audience to re realize his position, one's positionality 
uh, time and again. Humans might see water as flowing when looking at a river or as a circle when sailing on the ocean, depending on circumstances. Appearances are what we need to investigate. What appears to us as flowing and clear or as vast and circular uh, might be different from the perspective of other beings. For instance, for gods who see water from the sky, water is like glittering jewels. For beings who live in the water, it is a palace. I quote, all beings do not see mountains and waters in the same way. Some beings see water as a jeweled ornament, but they do not regard jeweled ornaments as water. What in the human realm corresponds to their water? We only see their jeweled ornaments as water. Hungry ghosts see water as raging fire or puss or blood. Dragons see water as a palace or as a pavilion. Some beings see water as a forest or as a wall. Thus, the views of all beings are not the same. You should question this matter now. Are there many ways to see one thing? Or is it a mistake to see many forms as one thing? It seems that there is water for various beings, but there is no original water. There is no water commons, common to all types of being." Unquote. So in the Mountains and Water Sutra, Dogen mentions new perspective on water. For hungry ghosts who are traditionally punished in the Buddhist hells, water is, is disgusting blood and puss. For uh, beings that cannot penetrate through water is a wall. By studying other perspective, we realize that water is not simply flowing and even that mountain might be walking. However, we should never brag about our knowledge of various perspective either. In fact, we also need to realize that we will never completely know water, mountain, and that we should continue searching. For instance, even, if, even after realizing that certain being might see water as a palace, still we are in no position to say whether anything in the world corresponds to our water. But perhaps a study of water should include the answer to this question. So no study of water could ever be definitive and complete. So I quote, uh, even if you see mountains as grass, trees, earth, rocks, or walls, do not take this seriously or wor worry about it. It is not complete realization. Even if there is a moment when you view mountains as the seven treasures shining, this is not returning to the source. Even if you understand mountains as the realm where all Buddha practice, this understanding is not something to be attached to. Even if you have the highest understanding of mountains as all Buddha's in inconceivable qualities, the truth is not only this. These are conditioned views. This is not the understanding of Buddha ancestor, but just, there is on the, on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, but just looking through a bamboo tube at the corner of the sky. So our view, even if it is the most sophisticated there is at this point, or if it is more sophisticated to those who take just one view to be the true one, still is the view of someone looking at the sky through a tube. So Dogen encourages us not to mistake what we see for the truth about the sky. Our situatedness is the starting point of our research and the place from which we need to open up. Next step, after realizing our situatedness and the one of our interlocutor or object of study is decentering, an essential factor towards sexus ataraxia and Dogen's enlightenment or awakening. So step two, decentering. So where does situatedness lead to? Donna Haraway concept of situated knowledges, partial locatable critical knowledges might be seen as helpful to translating on temporary terms, both sextus modes, which highlight how different aspects of our situatedness influence what appear to us, and Dogen's exploration of the situated view of ourself and of other beings is called to continuously opening up to new perspective. 
As a sexist did before her, Haraway does not think that relativism, total skepticism, or epistemological nihilism is the only alternative to dogmatism. There is a third way that takes the situatedness of every knowledge into account, and that forms a valid alternative to relativism for those who do not accept totalization in the ideologies of objectivity or any kind of God trick. I quote, the alternative to relativism is partial, locatable, critical knowledges, sustaining the possibility of webs of connections called solidarity in politics and shared conversations in epistemology. Relativism is a way of being nowhere while claiming to be everywhere equally. The equality of position is a denial of responsibility and critical inquiry. Inquiry, unquote. So the third way she sketches is a new objectivity that is different from the modern one, the enlightenment one, that was what a dominant dogmatic group imposed on others after deciding that what they saw and selected what was what everybody else saw or should have seen or should have regarded as absolutely true. Whereas relativism, just like dogmatism, is also founded on non-positioned claims, Haraway's new objectivity is continuously created in conversation with others. And Sextus, Sextus' inquiry into situatedness can cure the inquiry from dogmatically accepting any truth. Jay Garfield describes Sextus' project as therapeutic and compares it to the projects of the Buddha, Nagarjuna, and Wittgenstein, who attempt to, quote, cure the philosopher from the misconception that underlying any reasonable practice must be some set of certain propositions and that underlying those propositions must be some convention independent ontologically given reality, unquote. So this idea must be cured. Uh, when opposing claims result in, uh, <clears throat> in ground, result grounded in different starting points, um, what follows is not despair or acceptance of relativism or epistemological nihilism, but ataraxia, tranquility, undisturbedness. If the therapy is successful, the philosopher will look calmly at colleagues involved in heated discussion geared to convince each other uh, to the truth of one's claim. Um, and this, these people who look at this people quarreling will be undisturbed by the wish to promote any view as absolute, absolute truth. So tranquility results from accepting that nobody is in the center and that the view from nowhere is not available. So nobody should exhaust themselves in looking for it. And yet inquiry is meaningful and needed every time we are confronted with a new claim because every time we need to find out uh, how that claim was reached. So ataraxia does not emerge, would never emerge if the impossibility of finding the absolute truth would entail the acceptance of relativism. Sextus before Haraway refused to translate awareness of situatedness into relativism. Relativism just levels all claims to truth and is not interested in researching, researching any claim. Whether a claim is published in a peer-reviewed journal or in someone else's blog, it does not matter to the relativist. Such an approach gives up hope for critical inquiry, for conversation and a collaboration across differences. On the contrary, looking for situatedness enjoins one to delve deeply into what any claim rests upon. How is this conclusion reached? What are the arguments? What, are the, what is the disciplinary methodology? The assumptions, the assessment criteria. So ideally, a conversation across differences, say an interdisciplinary collaboration, is preceded by this kind of inquiry done by both conversants. This inquiry allows both conversation partners to decenter, having realized how they both are situated. 
The century makes them re ready to listen to the other, to look together for common ground, common values, a new solution to a problem, or a deeper understanding of a complex matter. The centering allows different parties to create a space for shared conversation and co-creation. Haraway calls this staying with the trouble. The trouble is to be found time and again in complex and unrepeatable situation one finds oneself in at any given moment. Sextus enjoins us to continuously stay with the appearances as they are at each moment, as we will see when tackling the third factor, continuous practice. But first, we need to delve into in the relation in Dogen's thought between situatedness and decentering. As we have seen, Dogen's invitation to become aware of situatedness and uh, involves the study of other perspectives. Water might appear flowing to us if we watch it from the shore or like a circle if we are in the middle of the sea. And yet it looks very different to fish and gods. The realization of our partial view belongs for Dogen to a constant effort in the centering. The centering happens when we let go of the habit of putting ourselves and our views at the center of reality, be believing that our views are true. The centering also involves letting go of the habit of imposing our views on others. In other words, the centering happens when we let go of our I whatever we identify with and see as occupying the center of the world. I quote, to study the Buddha is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the body and mind of others drop away. No trace of realization remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. So the self that Buddhism rejects is the I, the subject that believes to be at the center of reality, independent from it, permanent as, and well equipped to understand and study or utilize everything else, which is seen as a mere object with no perspective of its own. The self is one's egocentric intentionality, the intentional arc, or the karmatic charge of one's volition and ignorance that we constantly project onto the world around us, which we co-create by doing it. So forgetting the self and dropping the mind and body distinction and the I and other distinction is the only way towards opening up to reality rather than imposing our structure on it. So the Exploration of our other way of being positioned and other takes on reality helps this letting go in the knowledge that we will never be able to become aware of all possible points of view. And yet that we can stay open to new ways of perceiving and being. Dogen's project of studying and forgetting the self so as to be able to encounter the other as much as possible in their own terms can also be described as the non-duality of practice and enlightenment. The point is not to falsify any perspective, but to reveal the context that validates them while at the same time it limits its validity. Realization of situatedness and partial view, sometimes called delusion in Buddhist terms, is a sign of enlightenment. When the, when the dharma does not yet completely fill your body-mind, you think that it is already sufficient. When the dharma fills your body-mind, you think that something is missing. So enlightenment shed light, lights on delusion or situated knowledge rather than destroying it. The real game changer, according to Dogen, is being able to recognize one's own world-making perspective and being able to shed it when responding to a certain situation. Another way to approach delusion or situated knowledge is to regard it as our characteristic dim-sightedness, uh, which should not be seen as a sickness, uh, which if it cured would allow one to accept absolute truth, 
because absolute truth is inaccessible. So our original dim-sidedness, the one that it is supposed to produce flowers in the sky, right? Non-existent flowers in the sky, um, is actually our methodological and hermeneutic base of operation. Seeing flowers in the sky or illusory, illusory flowers is not caused by sickness. On the contrary, thanks to our dim sightedness, we can realize the flower of emptiness, which is another way of reading the same two kanji that produce kuge, that are pronounced kuge as uh, flowers of emptiness or flowers in the sky. So dim sightedness, when lived authentically, by those who understand it, that it is part and parcel of being interwoven in a network of emptiness, is results in the centering. And then this kind of dim sightedness is the key to enlightenment. Noe Keiichi uh, also attempts to sketch a third way between universalism and relativism. He suggests to take ethnocentrism, which can be seen as a version of Douglas and Kim's dim sightedness, as a starting point towards a dialogue across cultures, searching for a common ground, which he sees as an endless task. So once one is aware of their position, one can open up to different cultures and look for meeting points rather than absolute truth. One can then look for what I call universals for the time being. So the, the centering is the key, is the key to this project, which Noah describes as the continuous search, continuous search for universal cultural universals, which is the endless task imposed on us as historical being. In the same vein, Dogen's enlightenment does not manifest itself as a static awareness or tolerance for other views. The decentering that the recognition of other views brings about translates itself in action. The action is a response that is attuned to the specific situation that is founded on having found out our situatedness and the situated, situatedness of other beings, including on what factors they depend on. So enlightenment consists in letting things manifest themselves in their own way and responding to them in an attuned, non-instrumental and ob not objectifying way. In this Dogen enlightenment or awakening difference from Sextus Ataraxia, a peace of mind that seems to be relevant only to the subject who attains it. Dogen's enlightenment does also involve being able to respond to the world around one in a non-egocentric and biased way. Dogen, in his instruction for the Tenzo, the head cook, calls this turning things while being turned by things. Situatedness and the centering yields the possibility of co-creating reality rather than having one imposing their own reality onto the other. One co-create reality when they respond to any situation in which one sees any kind of others as a subject. If they send off a call, the one responds and vice versa. There is a deep analogy between responding to a situation rather than imposing one's intentionality and entering in dialogue with the other, seen as another subject. The other is not necessarily a human being. It can be the fish of the mountain and water sutra that sees water differently, or it can be an ingredient or a utensil in our kitchen that needs to be responded to without uh, superimposing our wishes on it. The centering involves the training in taking any other perspective seriously that is not regarding it as equal to any other, but uh, by investigating how things look from that perspective and how that perspective came about. This research, which involves granting the status of agent or actor to the object of the world, in the words of Har Haraway, turns out fundamental when responding to other, including what we might want to regard as mere objects of the world rather than agents 
or actors, such as animals, mountains, waters, and cooking ingredients. Dogen, as we have seen, calls this responding and co-creating, turning things while being turned by things. Haraway, by describing the formation of a community of diverse humans and pigeons, gives us an example of the need for situating oneself and the century when preparing for interaction across different species. So firstly, he mentioned very different ways. Pigeons are not only disvalued, but also valued by humans. For instance, for their navigation and face recognition capacities. Pigeons pick out different people in photographs very well too. And in Professor Shigeru Watanabe's Laboratory of Comparative Cognitive Neuroscience at Keio University, pigeons could tell the difference between paintings by Monet or Picasso. <clears throat> Recognizing different points of view on, in this case, pigeons, decenters us and shows us what a pigeon looks to us is just what our situatedness has made us see until now. This decentering can lead to a next step in which a dialogue can start, not only between humans and pigeons, but also between activists, computer scientists, pigeon fanciers, artists, etc. Training and practices interactions across diversity cannot be done without recognizing situatedness and training, the centering, time and again. Obviously, the experience of seeing water or mountain differently or getting involved in multi-species interaction will not be the end of one's journey of the centering. This brings us to the third element of continuous decentering, which is continuous practice. In fact, the practice of decentering and responder, responding needs to be continuous. Pironian skepticism is an agoge, a way of doing research and of living. Whereas accepting a doctrine as true can be done once and for all, skepticism as a way of life involves practices that must be continually reenacted to try to understand things on their own terms by being open to them as opposed to encountering them through the lenses of our interests, way of life, embodiment. Harris, um, Sextus philosophy can be seen as a medicine. So uh, Sextus compares his tools to purgative drugs that do not merely drain the humors from the body, but drive themselves out too, along with the humors. So if someone suffers from getting too attached to a view and so attached as to take it as the truth, Sextus tool help them get rid of it. However, as the medicine is not supposed to be stuck in one the, the digestive system forever, so the tools are not there to be believed in and taken for the absolute truth. Rather, any tool or strategy towards the centering is taken up if, can, if it can provide a cure against dogmatizing in a specific situation. So without commitment to any underlying reality or universal method. The skeptic needs to look at each situation in the now, in its own terms, refraining as much as possible from getting stuck in universal rules or stereotypes. Sextus makes it clear that the inquiry never stops by stressing that the skeptics, I quote, report descriptively on each item according to how it appears to us at the time. And at the time, translates katatonum in the now. So Sextus encourages us to conduct our inquiry time and again in every new situation. He justifies this continuous effort we must make by stressing that our situation and the appearances that we might be inclined to take as the truth change continuously. If we stop inquiring, we will start dogmatizing. Dogen is also particularly insisting on the need for continuous practice. Continuous practice means continuously shedding our perspective. 
and studying the moment when water sees water, which as we know, does not mean acquiring a definitive understanding of water, since when one side is illuminated, the other side is dark. So continuous practice of this entering is continuous practice of humility. Humbly aware of our positioned and limited view, we know on the one hand that it cannot be totally transcended, and on the other hand, that it is the only place we have to open up ourselves to other, to enter in dialogue and to respond to them. Dogen's non-duality of practice and enlightenment means that enlightenment can be seen as an endless process of attuning oneself to the world, dissolving the subject in favor of Merleau-Ponty's coexistence, Nagatomo's cohabitation, the traditional Buddhist concept, conception of codependent origination, or attunement as felt into resonance. Dogen is fully aware that there is no end to this process. I quote, when Dharma does not fill our whole body and mind, you think it is already sufficient. When Dharma fills your body and mind, you understand that something is missing. So enlightenment manifests itself as ceaseless questioning. It is a continuous striving to see things as they are, knowing that it is never entirely realizable. Conclusion. Both Dogen and Sextus send us a wake up call. We are embodied, tied to a certain perspective, to certain sizes and times that we can grasp and make sense of, and others that we are blind to. How to respond to our situatedness and epistemological limitations? Their call is to a continuous practice of situatedness, both of our claim and beliefs and of those of others. Realizing our situatedness and that of others leads to a decentering that is never definitive. It is the realization that needs to be continuously reenacted. In each situation, we are encouraged to never stop the inquiry, never be swayed by conflicting claims, never to cease to share for shared truth, to search for shared truths. The significance of the practice of continuous decentering is rooted in our natural tendency to dogmatize like infallible popes, in the words of William James. So to believe that what appears to us is the truth. Continuous decentering is the continuous attempt to examine and reassess personal beliefs, social customs, disciplinary assumptions, and provisional truths and anything that we can tend to take as the truth. By continuous decentering and inquiry into other situatedness and the views that they yield, we will pave the way for dialogue across differences, attune the response to the beings around us and co-creation of our world. Thank you. <laughs>